But uh, how many of you have heard of enlightenment before? You heard of enlightenment, right? Enlightenment's a, a nice word. Um, it's a trendy word. It's a contemporary kind of hipster word, right? Um, the word suggests that, that there's light breaking into the darkness, right? Enlightenment, that the, the light is driving away the old superstitions. And what would those superstitions possibly be? Well, chief among them would certainly be the notion that there is only one way to God. I mean, we couldn't possibly believe something that old-fashioned, could we? Could we? Well, many in our culture would reject the notion that there is only one way to God. I've run into them. I keep ending up having these conversations, like I said. I've bumped into this uh, on Facebook and in Bible study conversations we've had. And with people I talk to, it just... It's been coming up again frequently lately for some reason. Um, and, and, and in fact, I've even run into people in churches who would struggle to agree that Jesus is the only way to God. And frankly, a lot of people get uncomfortable when you tell them that Jesus is the only way to heaven, right? Maybe if you're sitting here, you might be among them today. And if so, I'll admit, I'm going to make you a little uncomfortable today. And I'm okay with that because I got the Bible on my side. And what I've learned, at least in my faith journey, is when I try to argue with God in the Bible, I don't often come up on the right side of that argument. So apologies if I make you a little uncomfortable today, but let's forge ahead anyhow. The message of salvation through only Christ has frankly never been a popular one. But today, those of us who hold that view, people like myself, can face Criticism, sometimes fierce criticism for holding on to that narrow view, for holding on to that exclusive belief that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And it's true, if you, if you watch uh, the changing cultural trends, you'll find in younger evangelicals that there is kind of a doctrinal squishiness occasionally on this issue. Is Jesus the Son of God? Yeah. Most would agree, sure, Jesus is the Son of God. No problem there, right? Did Jesus die on the cross and raise from the dead? Oh, yeah, 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 sure, good, we're good with that. Is he the only way to salvation? Now, hold on there, buddy, that's, uh, that's a little uncomfortable, right? That's, that's where we intersect with our culture. That's what I'm finding in our culture. People go, oh, yeah. Jesus was a good guy. He was a good teacher. Maybe even Jesus died on the cross. Jesus rose again. But, whoa, 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 pastor. Jesus is the only way? I don't know if I want to say that. What are people going to think of me? So why are we uncomfortable with the exclusive claims of the Christian faith? Well, there's many reasons for it. But I think one of the first and primary reasons, frankly, is The internet has changed the world. The internet has completely changed the playing field in a big, big way. A generation ago, right? If you grew up in Duluth or you grew up in Fargo or even in St. Cloud, a generation ago, you might not ever have much contact with somebody who was Hindu or maybe somebody who was Muslim or Buddhist, right? But the internet has changed all of that. If you look through my friends list on Facebook, you'll find people from every spectrum of faith, every color imaginable, all over the place with their beliefs and philosophies. People who don't believe in anything, people who believe in all sorts of other religions. We have Mormons, we have Christians, I've got Baptists, I've got Catholics, I've got lots of Lutherans, it's in Minnesota, right? Um, And you look through my Facebook page, you'll, you'll see on all those friends just a broad, broad diversity. And then along with that, there's just millions of informational websites about all the different religions and all the different views in the world. And, and because of this, this internet, which isn't a new thing as we know, ha- but it's, it's increased the idea of the global melting pot, right? It, it's caused us to be exposed to things that just a generation ago, people really didn't get much opportunity to see. 
Now, add to that, and we've talked about this before, uh, we had Wai Han Lu in uh, earlier this year, a missionary who works with students on the University of Minnesota campus. He particularly uh, specializes with uh, Chinese students because Wai Han speaks Chinese, but he also specializes in re- outreach to, to Muslims. Um, because he's from Malaysia, and so his experience in life has put him in situations that have uniquely gifted him to make those connections. And as a result of that, Waihan is able to, in the Twin Cities, be a missionary, right? He doesn't have to go somewhere else. God is bringing the people to him. Just across the highway from the gigantic new Minnesota Vikings Stadium, right? You basically have Little Somalia with a huge population of Muslims. Uh, We just had, through the election cycle, had um, what will likely become the first Somali-American state senator in the United States coming up through the election process in Minneapolis. Okay? So God is bringing all these cultures to us now, right? We're a generation ago... Well, we had some differing cultures, but it was Germans and Swedes and Norwegians, (laughs) right? And while, yes, they are a little bit different, they're still fairly homogenous. And so God is bringing people from all over the world to us and the websites and everything else. And if you go to the cities, for instance, if you've not paid attention You drive around the cities, there are Hindu temples in the Twin Cities. Did you know that? They're actually really beautiful temples. Their their artistry is, the construction and the architecture is gorgeous. And so we have those, we have mosques, we have meditation rooms, we've got the Christian scientists uh, have a huge place in downtown St. Paul, right? Um... All sorts of other competing ideas, philosophies, and religions. Once upon a time, they were all over there, right? They were all across the oceans. They weren't here. But now, they're just a few miles away, just a short drive. They're just at our doorstep, doorstep, so to speak. And as the world has grown smaller, some of the barriers that separate us, and I think that's a good thing, But some of the barriers that separate us have started to come down. But that does leave us in the embarrassing situation. How could we possibly believe that Jesus Christ is the one, the one and only way to God? I mean, that's a very enlightened point of view, Pastor. Well, is it? From the world's standards, it is. It's definitely out of bounds, so to speak, right? In polite company, it's not nice to say that because you don't know what everybody else might possibly believe, right? When you're at the workplace, do you want to stand up and say, well, Jesus is the only way? Well, I don't know. Do we want to do that? Do we do that in social settings? Does that make us a little bit uncomfortable to think about doing it? Because no one likes to be called a hate monger, right? No one likes to be called arrogant or intolerant. You ever been called intolerant because you believe in Jesus? I have. No one likes that. We can say it might not bother us, but if you've ever been called intolerant for your faith views, it bothers us a little bit. It makes you feel a little uncomfortable. Certainly we've all become aware of the spread of Islam in recent years, right? And I mentioned the changing face of America because the social culture that even I grew up in is rapidly changing. And complaining about it, folks, just a waste of time. The world is changing whether or not we want it to and whether or not we like it. And you can be that person over here just being grumpy and complaining about it, but it's not going to accomplish a thing. We have no choice but to learn how to get along in this nation with our neighbors who might follow vastly different philosophies, worldviews, and religions than we do. And as America changes, 
We face the danger of reducing the genuine religious differences to kind of a, a bland, lowest common denominator if we're not careful. The all religions are equal, right? Are they? When you hear people say all religions are equal, you can be sure of two things, right? If you hear somebody say all religions are equal, you can be sure of two things. One, they don't know what they're talking about, and two, they really haven't studied anybody else's religions. Let me say that again so I'm super clear. When somebody tells you all religions are equal, they don't know what they're talking about, and they don't understand other religions very much at all, if at all. Saying all religions are equal is an insult to thoughtful followers of whatever religions we are talking about, frankly. If you talk to your Muslim friends for a while, if you got Muslim friends, I have Muslim friends, if you talk to your Muslim friends for a while, you'll discover that their beliefs and our beliefs are radically different. Talk to a Buddhist. You'll discover that their beliefs are very different than the Muslims. And the same of Judaism and Hindu and so forth. It's easy to say that all roads lead to heaven, right? When you haven't studied the map very carefully. It's easy to say it. But what we need is an accurate map, an accurate road map of what tells us which road actually does lead to heaven. And then find that road and you will end up in the right place. Now some years ago, I read this this week, the General Secretary of the World Council of Churches was asked to name the number one theological issue facing Christians worldwide. His answer was unequivocal. He said, the pr biggest problem that Christians are going to face worldwide is the uniqueness of Christ. If Jesus is not unique, there is no gospel and we have no good news to preach to the world. So we face questions on several fronts in this message. First, what does the Bible actually say, right? That should be our source of wisdom. What does the Bible actually say about this? Second, how do we communicate this to others? And then third, how do we live in an increasingly pluralistic world? Pluralistic meaning there, there's more than one view, right? Let's tackle that first one. What does the Bible actually say? Consider the words of Jesus in John 14, 6. I already asked you to get there, so if you got your Bible out, John 14, 6. Jesus says these words. These are his own words. They're in the red in my Bible. I don't know about yours, but they're in the red. It says, I am the way, Jesus says. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. Now, if words mean anything. This is an utterly exclusive claim by our Lord. Without him, apart from him, there is no way to the Father in heaven, he's saying. If you decide Jesus is not for you, God doesn't have a plan B. Huh. And notice how personal this is. We're not saved by religion. We're not saved by a church, right? But by Jesus himself, it says. Jesus didn't say, I know the way, but rather he said, I am the way. Jesus never gives us a, a formula to follow. Instead, he calls his people to follow him personally because he himself is the way that leads to the truth. That leads to life with the Father in heaven. Now, if that was all the only place, I think we'd have a strong argument already. But, hold on, there's more. Right? Listen to the words of Peter in Acts 4.12. Peter says these words. This is Peter who denied Christ. This is Peter who had walked with Christ for years. This is Peter who got out of the boat and walked on the water with Jesus. And this is Peter who humbly repented before Christ following Christ's resurrection. Peter who was radically transformed 
by his relationship with Jesus. Peter says this in Acts 4.12. He says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven which is given men by which we must be saved. Then you have the words of the Apostle Paul, right? You remember Paul? Grew up a good, good Jewish boy, had the best teachers. He was, he was a magnificent example of what it was to be a Jew. And Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus. We just talked about it this week in our Bible study on Wednesday. Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus, and he goes from going to capture and kill Christians to, boom, becoming the advocate of Jesus. Does a complete 180. He was heading this way. Now he's going that way. And the Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 3.11. He says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that these three verses seem to be pretty absolutely definitive, right? There's no other way, there's no other name, and there's no other foundation. Jesus didn't say, I know the way, but rather he said, I am the way. Finally, consider this, 1 Timothy 2.5. Timothy was the understudy of Paul. Timothy writes these words, he says, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, and that man is Christ Jesus. The whole gospel boils down to this singular truth. Because our, as, a, as a people, our sins have separated us from God. Because of that, we need a mediator to bring us back to God. We're broken. We are tainted. Our sin has stained us. And God is perfect. And the perfect God will not put up, will not put up with the stink of our sin. So we need a mediator to bring us back to God. That sin gap is far too wide for us to bridge on our own. We need someone who is from heaven, who is perfect himself, to bridge that eternal gap. And scripture is clear that Jesus is the only one who could bridge that gap. By his death, he paid for our sins. He bridged that gap that separates us from God. By his resurrection, he proved that he is indeed the Son of God. No other mediator is necessary. Frankly, no other mediator is possible. Only Jesus, the perfect Son of God, could offer himself for our sins. He did what no other religious leader ever could do. In the very words of R.C. Sproul, you may be familiar with him, he's a pastor in Florida, a really, really brilliant guy. Um, R.C. Sproul says this in one of his books. He says, Moses could meditate on the law, Muhammad could brandish a sword, Buddha could give personal counsel, Confucius could offer wise sayings, but none of these men was qualified to offer an atonement for the sins of the world. Only Jesus offered himself as the divine sacrifice for our sins so that we might be saved. 1 John 4.10 says this, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation, to stand in our place, to atone for our sins. And we could add a dozen, probably multiple dozens of other verses to this list. The God of the Bible is an utterly exclusive God. He has no competitors. He is the living and true God, and there is no one like him in all of the universe. And he will not share his glory with some created thing. He alone deserves our worship and praise. And when his son declares that no one comes to the Father except for through me, he means it, folks. Now, the issue is not our emotions or our preferences. The issue is truth. Capital T truth, right? Sincerity. Sincerity in religion really is not enough. I don't doubt the sincerity of people who don't believe the same things that I believe. I don't doubt the sincerity of my Mormon friends or of my 
of my Muslim friends or my atheist friends. I don't doubt their sincerity and their beliefs. And in fact, frankly, oftentimes I admire their dedication to what they believe. Right? But sincerity only matters when it's applied to the proper object. You can be sincerely wrong and you will still be wrong. You can sincerely drink rat poison thinking nothing is going to happen to you. But if you drink rat poison, something's going to happen to you. And it's not good. Believing the wrong thing doesn't make it right. All truth is narrow. I mean, years ago we learned that 2 plus 2 is 4, right? It doesn't equal 5, it doesn't equal 3, no matter how sincere you are. That's the type of claim Jesus is making in the Bible. So then the question comes up, how do we communicate this to other people, right? The problem is not with what we believe or what the Bible teaches. I mean, Christians have always believed that Jesus is the only way to heaven, we just, frankly, haven't always expressed it with equal forcefulness. But the teaching itself isn't new. And as our world grows smaller, so to speak, as we rub shoulders with people from different religious backgrounds, how do we explain what it is that we believe in a way in which they can understand? I think the most important first thing you need to know is don't be afraid. You ever been afraid to share your faith? I have. It's okay. It's a safe place. We're, we're in a safe place. We're all family here, right? But I'm telling you, you don't need to be afraid. You don't. Because too often, fear makes us defensive about our own faith. Don't be afraid of somebody who doesn't share your point of view. Don't be afraid of your Muslim or your, your Hindu neighbors. Don't be afraid to strike up a conversation with a student or somebody you meet at the mall or wherever it is you might be. Don't be afraid to strike up a conversation with them even if they don't share your religious views. Too many Christians fit the stereotype of being all mouth and no ears. We talk, but we don't listen, right? Or, and I find myself having done this many times, we listen only so we can talk. Right? Anybody else do that? It's like, you're talking, I know you're talking, and I'm listening, but I'm thinking what I'm going to say back to you, and I'm not really listening. You can ask my wife if I do that. <laughs> right? And it's hard not to, right? I'm argumentative. My family tells each other that we love each other by arguing. That's how we communicate. If you're an outsider to my family, it seems a little awkward and weird, but that's just the way we say I love you. So we yell at each other and argue. Not in bad ways. We just, we're just people of opinion, and we're not afraid to share it. It's family, safe place, right? And so too often we're all about the mouth and not about the ears. And let me remind you, it's not a sin to listen to someone else explain about what it is they believe and how they go about practicing their faith. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's a good thing. You can learn something, in fact. You ever talked with a Muslim about why they pray the way in which they pray? Dedicated Muslims have a really good prayer life. I think something we as Christians would really benefit from learning from. Now, I'm not recommending you get a mat and you bow to Mecca. That's not what I'm saying. But the dedication, the devotion... The daily time in prayer every day of their lives? Spending an entire month fasting? I think they got something there that we would benefit from. It's a simple human fact that kindness shows interest in others. So one of the things we need to do as Christians is learn to close our mouth open our ears and listen intently and let God then lead the conversation. Now, now, as you're listening, pray about what they're saying. That's okay. I'm not saying, you know, just turn your brain off. Pray about what they're saying. Filter it. Think through what they're saying. But not just for an open door so you can share Christ. 
If your only goal in talking to somebody who has a different faith than you is to share Christ, that conversation is probably not going to last very long. My experience is if, if I want to make inroads, I need to invest in that person. If I want to tell my neighbor about Jesus, that doesn't come the day that I meet him out at the mailbox for the very first time probably, right? That comes after I shovel their driveway for a winter. That comes after I watch their kids for a year or two. That comes after I've invested in that relationship. And it's then that the barriers start to come down for most people, that they're willing to listen, that their, their hearts are, are fertile soil. So we have to wade into it with patience and with wisdom. Ask your good questions. Seek understanding. Find common ground where you can. You aren't compromising your Christian faith by showing kindness of, to followers of other religions. You're not. It's okay to enjoy friendship with somebody who's not a Christian. But pray along the way. Pray that God will open the doors. And pray that God will open doors that you never could on your own. Now if this is true, and I fully believe it is, then how do we live this out in our pluralistic world? Because there's no turning the clock back to go back to the good old days, right? When the other religions were still over there, right? Over there being anywhere else, but here. But frankly, I kind of like it better this way. I kind of miss my old St. Paul neighborhood. I kind of don't, too. But I kind of miss that neighborhood. We were one of, Kim and I, when we lived in City St. Paul, we were one of only a couple of white families on the entire block. We had Hmong, we had Japanese, we had African American, we had Latino, we had a blind guy who lived on our block. He was really cool. He'd, he was always open to conversations about faith. He didn't believe in Jesus, but man, he was searching. And he would go walking by the house Really cool. I don't know if you've ever interacted with a lot of blind people, but this guy knew where every house was. He knew where every sidewalk was. And he would come walking by our house. And it was like he just knew if you were outside. You didn't have to say something. You didn't even have to be making noise. I could be sitting there silent on my front step. And he would stop. And he would say something to you. Just amazing, right? And he knew I was in seminary and studying. So he always had really interesting questions for me. He'd only, just a couple years ago, become blind because of an accident. And he was really questioning, why? Why God? Why me? And he was angry at God. He wasn't sure he believed in God. But we got to talk to him a lot about God over the years. And I kind of miss that diversity. Where there was an Indian restaurant down the street, and there was, you know, uh, all kinds of delicious Asian restaurants, and East St. Paul's got Latino, and it's got Italian, and it's got Swedish, of course, and Norwegians, and some Finns, and others. But it was an interesting place to live. And I like that unpredictable mix, where different viewpoints are jostling for their place in the world. And we do have to think about how do we address this challenge of sharing Christ in a pluralistic world. And I've got three suggestions for you, and then we'll wrap up with it. If you want to be able to share Christ in this world, the first thing you have to do is ground yourself in the Word of God. Make sure you know what it is that you believe. Don't just read the Bible, but study it. Learn it. Memorize it. Find out what it actually teaches. Learn the doctrines of our faith. Let the Word of God become your foundation for your own life and for that of your family. If you don't have one, buy a good study Bible. I could show you a couple in my office. I've got an ESV one. Actually, I have two ESV ones. An NIV one. I have an NLT one. I have an NAS NASB one. I have lots of options. I can show you study Bibles if you want to look at a few. Buy a good one. They're handy. And then use it. Do what 1 Peter 3.15 says, right? Be ready to give an answer for what it is you believe and why you believe it. But don't stop just there. Read some good books on doctrine. 
We have a number of them in our church library. I have a bunch in my office. And then if you haven't been to our church's website, under the media tab, there's a page that says reading resources. That's a, a list that I have curated of books that I trust that I think are good books worth reading. If you go there, you'll find some pretty good doctrine books. One that's blindly and obviously called Basic Doctrines, right? I can't make that any more clear by picking one with that title. But equip yourself. The second thing that we can do is simply be bold about our faith. But be bold with a smile on our faces, right? As we are sharing Christ, as we are living out our faith, so many Christians fail to remember this point. We get angry and bothered when somebody challenges what we believe, right? We feel threatened when somebody doesn't share our faith. And the joy of the Lord is replaced with the wrath of the Lord. No wonder some people don't want to talk about it. If you get grumpy every time somebody challenges what you believe, and not just in religion, but politics and everything else, people are going to quit talking to you about things. They're going to quit, be willing, they're going to quit being willing to have deeper conversations with you. So be bold in sharing your faith, but be joyful in sharing your faith. Be loving as you share your faith. Be loving as you share the gospel. If people get angry, let it be because of the truth we proclaim. Let me try that again. If people get angry at us, let it be because of the truth that we're pro- pro- I can't say proclaiming. <sighs> One of those days. If people get angry, let it be because of the truth we are proclaiming. Not because of us. Not because of our angry words. If they reject us, let it not be because we treated them rudely. If sinners reject Christ, let it be because they truly reject him. And not because we lost our temper. Remember that, remember that a, a gentle answer turns away wrath, right? But a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15.1 You can't insult somebody into believing in Jesus. You can't argue somebody into heaven. You can't. And in fact, you'll make the gap wider if you try. Salvation is a miracle that God is in control of. It is only God who can work in the human heart. Only the Holy Spirit can convert the soul. It's not our arguments that win the lost. Unless the Lord is working in the heart, our words aren't going to make any difference at all. So therefore, we have to be gentle and loving and kind even as we are sharing absolute truth. We must be patient in that process and with all meekness say, here's what I believe. If we lose our tempers, we might win the verbal battle, but we're not going to win them to Christ. Speak the truth with a smile. And if smiling seems impossible, at least don't lose your cool. Because speaking the truth in love is always the best rule. The last thing I want to remind you of is that there is a huge spiritual hunger in this generation. That's why Islam's on the rise in America. That's why people are turning to New Age traditions. Right? Eastern religions are attracting more and more people. I see this in my own life. The incredible religious diversity testifies to the hunger that is inside, that is naturally there, that God, in fact, put there in each and every one of us. God put a desire, a hole, a brokenness in our heart, a spot that we on our own cannot feel. We were made to know God. And if we don't fill that gap with Jesus, if we don't fill that God-shaped hole in our hearts with truth, we will fill it with something. 
Everyone does. I think we're living in the greatest time ever. Really, I do. Yes, the world has problems. But there's amazing things happening today, folks. Now, it may well be that we're living in the final generation. God could come, you know, decide to send Jesus any day. That is possible. And that would at least explain why Satan has put so much effort recently into distracting us and trying to destroy us. But I tell you what, where sin abounds, grace abounds greater. The very fact that we live in a time that is so great but with so much spiritual darkness means that when the light shines, it really shines. You ever been somewhere like in a cave underground and they shut out all the lights? I've been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet underground in a cave, far, far removed from any opening and entrance to the outside world. When they shut off the lights, It's disorientating. It's uncomfortable. But then, if they turn on even the smallest of light, that light seems so bright in contrast. We have that opportunity, folks, to be that bright light. Let our light shine. Do not be discouraged by the task at hand. Instead, be encouraged by the opportunities that this world is presenting us. As you go today, don't don't forget. Never try to coerce, intimidate, or threaten somebody into believing about Jesus. It's not an effective gospel sharing strategy. But but always stand up for the truth. Always speak lovingly and joyously for what it is that you really believe. I'll close with this thought. Imagine we were, all of us, we were in the mountains. We're standing near the edge of a cliff. I used to be a backpacking guide. I've stood in places where it's frightening, frankly, to look down. I don't like getting close to the edge. I don't even like crawling up to the edge of cliffs and peering over with my whole body touching the ground and my head not touching the ground. I'm still uncomfortable about that. I'm okay climbing on a roof, but you get much higher than this roof and I get awfully, awfully shaky. Right? Now imagine we're standing there. We're having a conversation, you and me. We're standing there having a conversation and all of a sudden we see a guy who's walking towards the cliff. And we keep talking and all of a sudden I look over and I realize that's my blind friend from back in St. Paul. And he keeps walking, click, 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 walking towards the edge of that cliff, right? How loving would it be for me to let him find his own path? Should I or should I not lovingly say, hey pal, stop for a minute. I think you're going the wrong way. If you go a couple feet further, it's a long way down to the bottom and it's not going to end well. Folks, we do have to speak truth. We do have to speak truth into our culture. We can't just let our friends, we can't just let our neighbors, we can't just let our family blindly walk off the cliff. But we need to speak lovingly. We need to invest so that when he hears my voice as he's walking towards the cliff, he knows he can trust me, right? He knows he can believe that when I say, stop, because if you go any further, your world is going to end. Go into the world, folks, this week, joyously sharing the gospel, listening to other viewpoints, and loving as Christ first loved us. Amen? Let's pray.